Hi. Hi, how's it going? I'm Maria. I'm Joe. Good to see nice you. Nice to meet you. Nice Very you. exciting for you. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. So, um, <laughs> playing the Little One Drop event tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Crazy field, unlimited rebuys the first four levels. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on some strategy for getting started, for surviving day one? Yeah. You know, so you will have one bullet in this, right? One bullet. So I would say because there are unlimited re-entries for, you know, not all of the players will be taking the re-entries, right. but some right. will. You can expect that a lot of people will be gambling a yes. little bit er earlier on. Right. So since you are only one bulleting, I would say the best advice to kind of combat the people that are more playing a looser, gambly, aggressive style is, you know, um, just look for really good spots. You'll have kind of a, st a stack size because the you know you don't, you start a little bit shallower than right. some of the other tournaments. Right. Um, you want to look for a spot where you can kind of three bet somebody you know who you know is kind of raising a lot, trying to accumulate a lot of chips. Or you know if you get down to something like a twenty big blind stack, that's like an excellent stack size to reshove against um, a lot of those aggressive, aggressive openers players, sure, because sure. you still have a stack where you have. A lot of fold equity. equity. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so you don't have to have a monster hand. You just have to think that you know they're opening a lot. They're probably opening a really wide range. And so, if your three bet shoves get through, then you're picking up you know five, six big lines at a time just by doing that. Right, right. And you know, honestly, in these like big field tournaments, my best advice is you just kind of wait for the players to make the mistakes and you capitalize on them. Okay. Because I think people are always kind of in a rush, especially when the stacks are shallower, to play a lot of hands, to get involved a lot. And um, I think the best bet is to kind of sit back and, and of course, like being patient and being tight is important, but mostly it's about reading the player and okay. seeing what style they're playing. And, you know, if you see that there's a few players that, you know, are always constantly you know, continuation betting, dry flops, and things like you can take advantage of, of those kinds of players who just keep firing, you know? Sure, sure. Well, I, one of my strong suits, at least in the smaller stakes I play, is being able to read people and, mm -hmm. you know, put them on hands. Mm -hmm. But obviously, I'm not playing events like this and feels like this. From your experience, are there any, in today's game, it seems like it's changed so much. I've been involved for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, are there different tells that you're seeing? Yeah. In the aggressive players, other than the sea bets after the flop. Right. Or... I would say for like the the more amateur recreational player that you're up against in these tournaments, I would say their first level tells is usually the the kind of uh, it, it's indicative of what it is. So it's like if they act weak, they are weak. If they okay. act strong, they are strong. Um, I think it's very first level with a uh, majority of recreational players. With you know the really good players, they're gonna probably be like on a second level or a third level tell. So then you have to start reading theirs as the opposite of what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I also think your advantage is, is against those professionals is they're gonna probably see you as a recreational player because they don't recognize you from the circuit or whatever. Right. Um, and I think that they'll try to be um, a little bit more aggressive against okay. you, especially because they're gonna most likely re-enter because they are professional, so they are planning to you know, re-enter a few times. So they're probably gonna be trying to push you off hand. So I think that you know, if you have a really good pro at your table and they're showing a lot of strength, I think you should be willing to maybe put it in a little bit lighter against them. Okay. And what I see, I only see from television, watching on the internet, it seems like a lot of players are raising pretty light suited mm -hmm. connectors, mm -hmm. you know, or one gappers. Mm -hmm. Are you kind of experiencing that as well in these fields or is it still yeah. raising with pretty solid hands? I would say the thing is... Position maybe? Is, yeah, you know. I would say the thing is, is because you're playing ten-handed, um, that actually makes everybody's ranges a lot tighter than they sure. normally would be. Thanks. The difference between nine-handed and ten-handed is actually really huge, um, and it actually makes you know even the aggressive professionals be a little bit tighter with their opening range. But it's kind of like what you said: if you have position, and if they're kind of raising from late position, and you have an even later position and position on them, then it's okay to you know be a little bit more aggressive with your three beds, or maybe be a little bit wider with your calling range of their raises. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, you played a lot of events. I haven't. Have any advice on nerves and some of the things that you do to calm yourself down or to keep yourself focused in a situation? Yeah, I think that uh, the most important thing is no matter who's at your table, I think don't play like in fear of any of the players at your table. Of course, there's probably going to be some people that you recognize sure, sure. and sometimes you're going to start psyching yourself out a little bit like okay. I don't want to play against them. I don't want to get involved in pots against them. But I look at it as just an equal opportunity table at all times and you just have to try to play your best game and I think if you start to feel a little bit nervous then sometimes I like to just listen to music um, or I just kind of like to you know just center myself a little bit more or even talk to your neighbor I think that really calms the nerves when you have you know friendly table banter too um, but before a big tournament I just like to, you know, have a really, I don't like to get in and play right away. I like to have a really relaxing morning and I like to, you know, wake up for a few hours before and, you know, so that when I'm actually there, my head's completely in the game and I'm not thinking about, oh, did I return this email or did I do that other thing? Because I think sometimes people's focuses are so split when they're still thinking like, did I forget to turn the stove off this morning or something like that. So, you know, you really have to just make sure once you're in the game, you know, to put your phone away and just, you know, keep your head in the game couple of strategy questions like would you with the short stack let's say my stack is even I'm in level two do you ever want to get it in pre-flop with ace king or the nut flush draw after the flop um, I think it depends a lot on your how many big blinds you have I would say just generally speaking I think you'll be playing with basically a 30 big blind stack a lot in this tournament so um, I think 30 big blinds to get in pre with ace king in most situations is completely fine. I think anything more than 30 big blinds. I'm not saying like ever open shove obviously with right, ace right. king for 30 bigs, but mm. if somebody raises from late position, then I think getting in ace king with 30 bigs is absolutely fine. As far as, you know, flopping draws and, and stuff like that, I think if it's, you know, you obviously don't ever want to be in a position where you're calling off, you know, a significant portion of your stack on a draw. Um, only to fold the turn if you don't hit. So obviously I like to go all in if it means that I get to see all five cards. Um, but that's only if, you know, but obviously if somebody bets like 200 on the flop and you have like the nut flush draw um, and you have, you know, 3K in chips, I would probably just call the 200 sure. because there's no My real reason. <laughs> right, but, but if it was like they bet a thousand and yeah. you have, you know, 3,000, 3, then, then, then at, in that, at that point, then, you know, you Hold decide if you yeah. wanna, yeah. <laughs> So I think it depends a lot on, you know, your stack size. But like I said, I think with the blind, with the 30 big blind stack that you'll have a lot of this tournament, I think that, you know, a lot of uh, pre-flop getting it in with good hands is, is perfectly fine. Okay. So especially when you're getting kind of close to the money bubble, there's a lot of different variables at play. There's going to be the big stacks that are going to try to take advantage of the people that are kind of blinding into the money. Sure, sure. Um, so I would say if you are one of the bigger stacks, then obviously put the pressure on the short stacks because obviously they would have to call off their tournament life, um, whereas you don't. So it's really important to kind of keep your foot on the gas pedal against those players. Um, is that Would that be to medium to small stacks, not super short stacks, because if I'm raising light they're, and they shove, I'm kind of in a pickle, right? Or no, what, what are your thoughts yes, on that? Yes and no. It, it would seem that you would basically be priced in to call off a right, short stack probably. if you were raising, but at the same time, what ha they basically have to have almost aces to get it in with you. Some people, I've seen people fold aces on the bubble even, you know what I mean? Get because they get cracked, and they want to get in the money. And because they want to get in the money. Right. So so you have to find the player that's willing to go with their hand, no matter how good it is, on sure. the money bubble. So I think that the combination of that situation happens pretty rarely with those people that do want to cash right. really badly, that I wouldn't be too worried about okay. that. Um, and also, if you were one of the shorter stacks going into the bubble, I think you should look at this as a complete free roll because it is, you know? <laughs> right. And I think you need to not let them take advantage of you in that situation because they're trying to take advantage of people that, you know, really want to, you know, make their money back. But if you look at this, you know, you, you got a free buy-in and you should try to play to win then. Right. Yeah. I agree with that. Sure. Yeah, I definitely think that in this tournament when there is such a good mixture of really good players and really bad ones, I think that if you have a very good player to your direct left or like two to your left, I would tighten up my pre-flop raising range a lot because they'll for sure, you know, take advantage of that. They'll be three betting light mm -hmm. a lot. Um, 
but if you have weaker and also if you have weaker players at your table it's kind of like there's a table of 10 people you don't have to be playing pots against the same person all the time it's not like it's a shorthanded game uh, you you can choose to basically play pots against weaker players where you feel more comfortable where you feel like you have more of an advantage and there's nothing wrong with that and it's actually a really good strategy because you know it's kind of like why do you want to fight with a bear if you could fight with a right. puppy you know I don't <laughs> <Yeah>. know <laughs> Maria thank you so much for taking the time to spend with me I know you're busy you got an important event yeah. thank you for the advice I am so excited for you and oh. I'm gonna get your table number and I'm gonna come check up on you on break so awesome thank you so much <laughs> yeah, it was a pleasure please. good luck thank you